So I mentioned levels a couple of times here. This is an important concept a lot of you have probably already heard about. You've got two categories of levels for PCI classification. There's merchants and there's service providers, which we just talked about. For merchants, and that's any of you just taking credit cards uh, under your own merchant account, there are four levels, with one being the biggest and four being the smallest. Some people find that counterintuitive, but one is the biggest uh, in this case. So that would be any merchant doing over six million Visa transactions a year. Why does it say Visa? Okay, because every card brand has their own classification scheme. I'm not gonna try to confuse you by showing you five different classification grids here. Most people go by Visas. Most of the others are in line with this, so I'm just gonna focus on this. There are some slight variances with the other card brands. Generally speaking, over six million a year makes you level one. One million to six million makes you level two. And this is number of transactions, not dollar volume, okay? A level three is anyone doing 20,000 to a million e-commerce transactions. That is things going over an electronic channel like the web. Number four, level four is anyone doing under 20,000 e-commerce transactions or up to a million non-e-commerce. So if all your transactions are going over the phone or card presence, you can have up to a million and still be a level four. But if it's mostly web-based, as soon as you go over 20,000, you move to level three. So that's a little different at the level three four mark. On the service provider side, there's only two levels. Those of you who haven't been keeping up, it used to be three levels. They changed that a couple of years back. It is only two levels now. Over 300,000 transactions per year across your entire client base, you're level one. Under 300,000, you're level two. It's that simple. Now, what does that mean? What it means in terms of validation is important to understand. So I, I have to spend a, a couple of moments on this slide. This is a critically important one to, to be clear on. There is a, uh, the, 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 the column here that says compliance actions. Notice that it says comply with the PCI DSS, and it says required right on down the board. Regardless of what your merchant level is, regardless of what your level of service provider is, everyone is required to comply with the DSS. That is very important to understand. There is no difference there. Where the differences come in is in terms of validation, and it is important to understand that validation is not the same as compliance. Everyone dealing with credit cards at any level is required to uh, comply with all of the requirements from the DSS to whatever extent they apply, to whatever extent they are relevant to your business. We'll talk more about what that means a little bit later. Validation is different. Validation can be accomplished just by checking some boxes on a questionnaire. Actually being compliant means you actually have to be doing these things on a day-to-day -day basis, not just when you fill out the questionnaire and you have to be doing things that go beyond the questionnaire, which a lot of people don't understand. So here you see an overview of the four different types of self-assessment questionnaires. If you are one of the organizations that qualifies for a self-assessment, uh, and actually I, I apologize, I'm gonna back up just a moment because I should have pointed that out, that if you are a level two or three or four organization, it is the self-assessment questionnaire that you're dealing with. It's only the level one merchants right now and the level one service providers right now that are required to have an on-site assessment. I said right now for a reason, because that is changing. That's one of the things we'll talk about. I'm gonna come back to that later though, just to not muddy the waters for right now, but level two merchants, you got changes that we'll need to talk about coming out of MasterCard, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Service providers, level ones need an on-site validation, level twos can self-assess. Now, what does that mean? If you qualify for self-assessment, there are four different types. And actually, there's now five different types because they slid in another type of self-assessment called a, a C-VT for virtual terminals. I didn't bother to list that out here yet, but these are the four main types of self-assessments. The A is the, is the short form type, the easiest to fill out, and it's intended for people that have pretty much entirely outsourced card data handling. It is only intended for people doing card not present, there's no card present transaction going on, and you've entirely outsourced all that handling such that you're not hosting your website in a way that that card data is flowing through your network. That card data never enters your environment. You never see it. You never touch it. It goes straight through some third party, and they're compliant themselves. That's a scenario that supports a SAC type A. Type B is for people either doing the old imprint machines, not doing any of the new technology at all, or people doing standalone dial-up terminals, like maybe those convenience stores that don't have any network stuff, don't have any 
network level communication or electronic card data transmission. It's just swipe it at the terminal and it goes over a phone line. Those can go over, a, use a type B questionnaire, which is also pretty easy, only 26 questions. Now, the C and the D type are the more challenging ones. A type C questionnaire is for those organizations that are not storing any card data. They might have some electronic card data being transmitted, but no stored card data. Now, there are some very important additional criteria for type C that I'm not going to have time to go into today, but it's very important to understand that just because you're not storing card data does not mean that you automatically qualify for a type C questionnaire. There are about five specific sub-criteria that the council outlines in their uh, self-assessment questionnaire instructions document that's available on their website, and I'd be happy to follow up with anyone that's interested in that in a later time. But again, just because you're not storing data does not automatically mean you qualify for a type C questionnaire. Basically, everyone that does not meet these five specific criteria specified by the council, everyone else falls into a type D questionnaire, which as you can see has 201 questions. Pretty much one-to-one -one in terms of one question for every requirement in the DSS. So the intent, the obvious suggestion there is that you need to cover everything. The, the, the risk here, and what I constantly see organizations missing is, if you do qualify for a type C questionnaire, that does not mean that you only have to address 42 requirements that are indicated in that questionnaire. Very important. For one example, the type C questionnaire does not include, one of the questions in there is not requirement 11.3, pen testing. It's not in there. And yet, that's one that I specifically followed up and confirmed with the council, and I have it in writing from them. Absolutely, their expectation is that you are still doing pen testing because you still have a network that's transmitting card data that could be compromised. So they confirmed more broadly than that, that and it says this, they pointed out in the self-assessment questionnaire on the attestation page, you will see in the fine print that it says, note, all organizations are expected to comply with the DSS in its entirety. A lot of organizations miss that, and unfortunately a lot of the banks are still sort of uh, providing some misleading info there saying, uh, just give us a SAC C and you're all good, like that's all you got to do. So you guys need to know that that's all you need to do for your bank, but that doesn't mean that your work is over. The other type of validation that happens if you don't qualify for self-assessment is an on-site assessment by a QSA. Or what we'll talk about later is uh, an assessment that would be done by an internal security assessor. This is a new option coming to the table for some of you, and I'll come back and talk about that later but it would be essentially the same type of on-site assessment. Now, don't worry, you're not losing your eyes, folks. You shouldn't be able to read the text here. I'm just showing you a sample of one of the grids that we use when we're doing validation, which is compiled entirely based upon the QA uh, uh, validation criteria provided by the council, which specifies in detail how QSAs are required to validate each of these different requirements. So they go beyond the wording of the individual requirements and even the testing procedures, which you all have access to, they go beyond that and say you should be doing specifically these types of validation and you should be, you should be checking these types of configs and you should be looking at these documentation, uh, these types of evidence, you should be interviewing people, you should be observing these things. They get into all these details that totals up to over 1,000 individual types of, of uh, validation. Now, they're, they're, they're taking this in a little bit of a, direction, a different direction now with, the, with their latest QA program, but this is still really the intent and what they're, what they're pushing. The reason I'm bringing this up is that you should know that whether you are going to have an on-site assessment because you fall into one of those categories, or if you're going the self-assessment route, you should be aware of this because even if you're self-assessing now, if you ever have a breach, this is the kind of validation that's going to happen, and this is what you need to be prepared for in order to actually show that, yes, we were compliant. So regardless of what level you're at, this is really the level that you should be striving for in terms of being able to support this level of validation, which means having a lot of good documented processes, evidence on hand, repeatable processes that you can demonstrate with evidence that they're working consistently. So let's talk about scope. This is a very important concept to understand and will have a significant impact on what it costs you to deal with PCI at the end of the day. First of all, any system component that stores, processes, or transmits cardholder data is absolutely in scope. So that could be any system, a server, a workstation, a network device, uh, application, users even. Anything that's touching card data, it's in scope. That's your first rule. 
So kind of think about this as we're going through it. Think about how this relates to your own environment. All those call center employees, yep, their PCs are in scope. Uh, your IT folks who are uh, supporting systems, they're in scope. I'll get to that one momentarily here. Uh, all connected systems are also in scope. What does that mean? Think about how your network is segmented. I'm sure we have at least a few network guys on the, on the call here. If you have different network segments in your environment, and you have in a certain network segment even one system that's in scope because of touching car data, then every other system that is also in that network segment is automatically in scope, even if it doesn't touch credit card data. That is the rule for scoping because, as any security guys on the line would know, uh, if somebody was able to compromise one of those other systems because they're not being managed to the same standard, it's much easier to then compromise a system that's sitting on the same segment where you don't have to go through a firewall and other layers of security. So their rule is, if it's in the same segment, it's in scope. And that is why segmentation becomes so important to reducing the scope for PCI, which we'll talk about again uh, in a short while. Next, all systems involved in managing the security of other in-scope systems. So think about all those systems we just covered, all of the ones that are touching card data directly, plus all of the other connected systems. And then think about, OK, what are the systems that manage the security of those systems? Those security management systems are also in scope. So those are the three main categories of systems. And then you have personnel as well. They're sort of their own category. Any personnel that has access to card data or who has privileged access to the card data environment, such as IT folks, DBAs, et cetera, those are all in scope, so to speak, uh, as it relates to security awareness training, background checks, some other things like that that we'll talk about. So scoping is very important to understand. And as I mentioned, network segmentation and access controls, you know, controlling who can get to various parts of the environment, those are the keys. I cannot stress that enough to controlling the scope and subsequently the cost for PCI compliance. There's nothing more important if you take one thing away from this. If you're at the stage of just doing your planning for remediation, there is nothing that more beneficial you could do than take a look at whether you've, you've segmented the environment to fully support an optimized PCI scope. That is the best thing you can do early in the process.